With the blancmange putting my guests firmly in the Tudor spirit, it's time for my monstrous main course. In the court of Henry VIII, 80% of all food consumed was meat, so I'm planning a carnivore's dream. Tudor royalty used meat to show how powerful they were. It was a status symbol, a kind of culinary bling. And so at feasts, they went to outrageous lengths to create dishes that would blow their guests' minds. Henry VIII loved to flaunt his bling, and splashing out on expensive meat was all part of the show. To impress the King of France, he spent the equivalent of five million pounds on one legendary feast, serving up more than 2,000 sheep, 1,000 chickens, and a whole dolphin. But most impressive of all was to serve up a creature that no one had ever seen before. An edible mythical monster, cunningly constructed by his chefs bolting together bits of different animals. I found a recipe in a historic English text called the Halean Manuscript that actually explains how to create one such Frankenstein creature, a cockatrice. So imagine the opportunity to create an edible, mythical monster. Just the thought of that makes the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. I'm going to cook up a cockatrice exactly according to the original recipe. But first, I need to build the creature. And for that, I'm seeking some expert medical help. The original recipe calls for joining the back half of one animal to the front half of another. So where better to come than somewhere does corrective surgery? <laughs> Speak to the experts. Start there first <laughs> and then move on. To assist me with this tricky operation, I've enlisted the help of top plastic surgeons, Sam Orker and Peter Amstein. What have you got here, then? OK. The idea is to try and make a mythical creature, a mythical beast. So a flying pig? Flying pig sounds good. Right. OK. I want to follow the original instructions to the letter, but as with most Tudor recipes, that's easier said than done. Take a capon and draw him clean and smite him at two in the waist. Take a pig and smite him also in the waist. Take a needle and a thread and sew the fore party of the piggy to the hinder party of the capon. And then put him on a spit and then serve it forth for a real meat. <laughs> Thankfully, with Peter's surgical knowledge, he can see exactly what the Tudors had in mind. So this is, yeah. here's the ribcage coming to there, yeah. just at the waist level. Yeah. And we but can work that, out what the similar good. diameter. Yeah. Yeah. So cross here. Have you ever been asked to do anything like this before? This is just my normal Sunday procedure. Is it? <laughs> for Sunday lunch. Scalpel, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. please. Thank you very much. So mind your fingers. Cutting doesn't seem to be a problem. Scalpel. <laughs> we should employ him, shouldn't we? That's right. <laughs> He's a little bit of a team here. Now comes the tricky part, joining the bits together. We want to make it structurally sound. And what we normally do when we do human parts, which come off, we wire bits on. We've got to fix the bones first. Otherwise, the meat bit will be all floppy. We probably want some fairly heavy gauge wire. I'm not sure the Tudors would have this. But... <laughs> uh, we've got a bit of we've got a bit of uh, artistic license. As in a real operation, we use surgical wire to fix the bones together, and then close up the skin with nylon thread. One of the things that really enticed me with this cockatrice recipe was that actually Tudors obviously had a want to to really use food to create theatre, to have an impact, to have a wow factor. They like to make food that might seem like something else. They might make a savoury look like a dessert, a dessert look like a savoury, or in this case, actually just make up a completely new animal. Your tail's got on the end. Fantastic. And it should be pretty secure. Here it is. My pig-type chicken-type cochrane trees. What I've got to do now is cook it. But will my mutant meat monster be enough to blow my guests away? <laughs> I'm creating the freakiest dish in English culinary history, an edible monster called a cockatrice. 
carefully following the original recipe, I've built the creature with the expert help of a plastic surgeon and given it a blast in the oven. Now I need to finish cooking it on a spit. So in the great tradition of English meat eating, I'm taking it to the local kebab shop. They've been serving donners here for 15 years, so I know I'm in good hands. Yes, yes. Oh, my name is Bobo, no problem. Is it? <laughs> yes, my name is Barchi, no problem. With another hour on the spit, my cock and trees is cooked to Tudor perfection. All I need to do now is see what the great British kebab eater makes of my creation. Is that a pig? No, no it's, it's not a pig. It's a pig chicken, half pig, half chicken. It, it's not alive now, but it was. It's half pig, half chicken. Yeah. I'll eat it. So, uh, we can taste it. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. It's not often you get to taste a pig chicken. Is it better than you expected? Yeah. So you got that, that, it's got that kind of funny... That's lovely. Yeah, <laughs> see? I can imagine that on the table of Ozzy Osbourne. <laughs> 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 on the Osbourne tables or Gene Simmons. My cock and trees has certainly made an impression but not quite the one I was after. This is the starting point of the recipe. It's a visual spectacle. Well, <laughs> not that one, but it could be a visual spectacle. It's certainly not a uh, gastronomic delight. It's pork and chicken. I want a Tudor dish for the 21st century. And this, my friend, ain't it. To really wow my guests, I need a creature that goes way beyond just pork and chicken. It's time to create the daddy of all meat monsters. The starting point should be, how can we make the most mythical, extreme, possibly disturbing animal to give our guests a right royal shock? I'm going to try turbocharging the Tudor recipe by building a new creature from much more unusual animals. But before I do any sewing, I want to test the idea. We have managed to find a collection of slightly exotic meats. Python. Medallion of crocodile. There's camel, steak, which could be from the hump. Kangaroo fillet, zebra. Have you ever eaten a zebra? Eaten zebra. No, me neither. I'm going to use the meats to design a new extreme cock and trees. Zebra body, ostrich leg. Camel, camel hump, hump and the tail of a python. My new monster mashup will certainly look amazing, but what will it taste like? Now what we're going to do is just take a thin slice of each of these, cook them, taste them, and then we have to go from there. First, I'm going to try the snake. Oh, it's really chewy. See down here? The zebra looks even worse. But we cooked that for two minutes. It yeah, is absolutely bone dry. What's this one? This is the crocodile. Really the chewy. There's a reason why a lot of people eat beef and pork and lamb and chicken and duck yeah. and don't eat python and camel humps and stuff like that. As we are talking about the Tudors, I think it makes a lot more sense to look at meats that we have a history of eating. Clearly, to make a dish that tastes any good, I need to go back to the idea of using a combination of traditional English meats. But I somehow still need to make it look spectacular. So it's back to my books for some more Tudor inspiration. I've discovered that another thing that the Tudors did that was really theatrical was that they'd serve their animals with the feathers or fur still on and then they'd whip that off at the table, revealing the cooked meat inside. That's given me an idea. I want to apply the same Tudor trick to my cock and trees. I'm going to serve my monster complete with all its fur and feathers and conceal a delicious meat dish inside it. I've chosen four meats eaten by the Tudors, and armed with some suitable specimens, I'm hoping taxidermist Derek Frampton can help me construct a really mind-blowing monster. 
I'd like to make a cocking trees of my own, okay. and I brought a couple of props. All right. <laughs> <laughs> That's meant to be. A <laughs> it's meant to be a goose. Okay. <laughs> well, a puffin, but. <laughs> and the middle section would be a lamb. Oh, uh, yeah. The head of a pig. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Derek's going to mutilate the cuddly toys to create a rough mock up of the creature I have in mind. The challenge here is making it seem like this fictitious animal actually did live. Based on our cuddly model, he's then going to make a full-size monster from the skins and feathers of a real goose, lamb, hog, and chicken. Inside this creature, I'm going to place an incredible meat dish made from these four constituent animals. The idea is actually to have the, the edible bit in this midsection. So I need to make a small compartment. Do you think you could do that? Yes, certainly can. Obviously, Brilliant. it's going to be a lot bigger. <laughs> yes. <laughs> With the construction of my cock and trees left in Derek's capable hands, there's one final thing I need to attend to. The Tudors love to enhance their feasts and special occasions with pyrotechnic effects. Shakespeare's plays were enlivened with spectacular fireworks and explosions. An accident with a stage cannon caused his Globe Theatre to burn down in 1613. And during Henry VIII's feasts, animals were served breathing fire. Setting fire to a Christmas pudding is a remnant of this tradition. Dr. Andrea Seller at University College London has been working on an idea to really make my cockatrice go with a bang. It's ordinary cotton cellulose, which has been treated with a mixture which includes nitric acid. When you light it, one feeds the other. Okay, so let me just show you. The idea is we just wrap this chicken in uh, this fun cotton. We'll see how it goes up. Let's just put a little bit more on there. Ready? Steady. Whoa! Look at it. That's Is brilliant. there any residue on that's, the chicken? Yeah, that's it. Now... It can easily be made to look like a wall. It goes up a treat, and there's nothing left. That effect was, I think, was great. Derek, the taxidermist, has finished my cock and trees, and back at the feast, I eagerly await its delivery. More than any other dish on this feast, cock and trees, this main course, sums up what the Tudors are all about. Spectacle, the whole theatre, that wow factor. I love the idea that it wasn't just joining two bits of meat together. It was actually to create a mythical creature. That's fantastic. This is it, my mythical cockatrice. It's got the head of a pig, a wild boar, the comb of a very large chicken, the body of a lamb, the wings and back end of a goose. Now, in here is the cavity for the actual meat that the guests are going to eat. A mythical beast like this needs to be filled with a mythical cut of meat. I'm going to use meats from the four animals that make up my unusual creature to create a very unusual joint of meat. We've got here a saddle of lamb. Imagine a rack of lamb, lamb chops. Two racks together like that. Bones taken out. The meat, the eye and the meat left in. I line the saddle with a minced, dry, cured ham. Then place a cylinder of rolled chicken meat in the center. To make the different meats stick together, I'm using something you won't find in your local supermarket. This is a protein that was originally derived from the belly of a tuna, and it was used to actually bind together wounds in the wall. And it causes the proteins on the two bits of meat that you're joining to join, join together. Finally, I add some goose breasts. The joint is then wrapped in cling film and gently cooked in a water bath. If I slice through it, now that, that to me looks like the anatomy of this cotton trace.
for the final touch, I brown the outside fat. Just put the meat into the cockatrice. I've got one more thing to add. Some special wool. And this will add the real Tudor theatrical touch. This wool is so flammable, if my guests get too close, they can lose their hair. So I need a way that we can ignite the wool from a distance, hence a fuse. Oh, it's the hog. No, it's Ruth. <laughs> Is that? Oh my god. Oh no, and it's got a hog's head. Oh, it's it's gone. more than one animal. It is, you're oh. right, it's a spliced beast. Yeah. Oh, it's got wings. It's from and it's got a oh. My. And a hog, it is the hog. It's a flying pig. It is quite literally oh, from out of good. this world. Oh, no. What an ensemble. That's unbelievable. <laughs> Kenny's gone bloody mad. He's trying to kill us. <laughs> well, at least we know it's been cooked. <laughs> that was good. I don't think they expected that kind of literally ignition explosion. Very quiet. Well, you know, it's theatre. It had a fantastic impact, yeah, as much as I could hope for, but it counts for nothing if the food doesn't support it. What it what is this? What is this? Cook and twist meat. A cook and cook and twist. This is a cook and twist. Which is a creature it's of many parts. It actually looks like a swan has died bumming a boar. <laughs> We've got goose at the back, sheep in the middle, boar at the top, so all of those are in there. Oh, I see. Okay. And is that what they do, then? They, they, they merge the Yeah, you know, Tudors of a, you know, Saturday night would do nothing but merging meats. It looks wonderful, doesn't it? Uh, I'm serving my cock and cheese meat with wilted spinach and a side dish of lamb jelly. Beautiful. I can't quite work out what I'm getting where. Uh, Sophie and I spent a good what, ten minutes working out every kind of meat that was in here. There's four, and uh, together, as this mythical beast, it's amazing. It's perfect, absolutely perfect. This is as good and as successful as we could have possibly hoped for. But what about my awkward customer? Kelvin. I don't know anything about any of this world. All I would say was that this is mm. quite delicious. Mm. And um, oh, and uh, I think it's a bit of a thumbs up to old Heston, who's obviously flogging himself to death out the back. I want to know how and uh, how, he, how he does all this kind of stuff. That's his magic. My monstrous creation seems to won over even my harshest critic. But how is he going to react to my pudding that isn't a pudding. 